So this is the beginning of chapter 15 on oscillators. And the first uh, thing that I wanted to do is just um, point to you the this figure that shows the, the basic principle of sinusoidal oscillations. So we're basically um, talking about sinusoidal oscillations. And we talked about feedback networks already. So here we have our uh, our familiar feedback loop with the uh, with the amplification element, the feedback network, and the idea here is that we want this to become a self-sustained oscillator, meaning that x uh, sub s is, is zero. So we're not going to um, to be putting any any input into this network, but uh, we're going to discuss what are the con the conditions in this closed loop that would allow x of zero the output to be uh, a useful stable oscillator. Okay, so that's what we're going to start doing um, today. Okay, so that figure that we saw. has a closed loop uh, transfer function given by our amplifier network and also our feedback network. And uh, the loop gain, we had to find that um, before. So this is just a uh, a reminder. Is defined as a times beta, and the the denominator of this transfer function is what we call the characteristic equation of the system. So that would be we can write this as 1 minus the loop gain and what we want is that characteristic equation to be 0 equal to 0 and uh, at that point we we will have oscillations now if we look at that in the frequency domain and what that implies is that, um, let me say here, because we're going to call this the oscillation criterion, so in the, what that implies is that in the frequency domain We want that loop gain to be equal to 1. And omega naught is actually the frequency of oscillation. So what that implies, because this is a complex expression, are two things, that the phase is 0 and that the gain of that expression is 1. So the phase is 0 because this 1 is a real number. So that's also um, that's also 
called the Warthausen criterion. Which basically saying that to um, to produce and sustain oscillations we want and, and that's with to produce a sustained oscillation with the input so this is the, the part where we say well that input is going to be zero okay so if that input is zero back in our feedback network the feedback signal is beta times the output so and then and that implies so this is just looking at it from the feedback uh, loop theory perspective. That implies that A beta is equal to 1. So um, again, matching the, uh, the oscillation criterion. So if we... Um, keep digging, going further, we can say that to sustain oscillation the pulse of the system uh, which, which are the uh, the characteristic equation that we define, the roots of that equation, um, must be at the um, in the um, imaginary axis at the imaginary axis at the frequency of oscillation If you think about what that means, um, and you put it in this expression, the factors of this the factors of this um, will look like uh, S square plus omega naught square. So that way we will ensure mathematically that yields that S uh, the roots of this the value of S is at um, conjugate values in the imaginary axis. So that's the premise, sort of the um, introduction and fundamentals. So how do we analyze uh, 
oscillator circuits. So let's take a look at that uh, procedure. Well, it's a feedback uh, system, so just like we did before in the, um, in the chapter on, on feedback, uh, the first thing that we need to do is break, <clears throat> break the feedback uh, loop to determine the loop gain. to determine the loop gain, which is AOS beta OS, okay? And then, once we have that expression, we can find the oscillation frequency We can find that oscillation frequency, which is omega naught, uh, and that is going to be the frequency that uh, makes the loop gain uh, or the phase of the loop gain uh, zero or 360 degrees. Okay. So, so that would be um, So that's then we can find uh, omega naught. Now the other part is that we must find the condition for the oscillation to start. Now that we have omega naught, what is the condition for the oscillation to start? Because we have two conditions: the phase and the gain. So you start you you find that from the um, from the second part of the criterion, which says that the amplitude must be greater or equal to one. But to really, as a matter of practice. Uh, of a practical issue is that so this is a practical issue so making the loop gain is this here because we have omega naught So, just making the loop gain slightly greater than zero, or oh, I'm sorry, greater than one, ensures if you just make it one, you're not guaranteed for oscillations to 
uh, to start because what you have at that point, if you recall your control theory, is uh, a system that is marginally stable, but it's not stable. An oscillator is stable, but it needs to start to sustain that oscillation. So you're not guaranteed that you would get oscillations. You may get oscillations, you're not guaranteed. So to guarantee that, we make, as a matter of, of pra a practical issue, that loop gain is slightly uh, greater than one. And also, as a, as a matter of, of practicality, if you keep that loop gain slightly, well, any amount greater than one, eventually your, your system is going to saturate because eventually those oscillations are going to uh, increase unboundedly until as a matter of practicality, you saturate at the power uh, at the power supply limits. So what we're going to see is that practical oscillators were going to start at power up, let's say, with uh, the poles located such that that gain is slightly greater than one, and then we're going to use nonlinear feedback methods to as the oscillation starts, we're going to throttle those poles back to the j omega axis so at that point we get exactly zero uh, phase and unity gain and the oscillation will um will be sustained and then through this uh nonlinear feedback method uh if for some reason the oscillation starts dying out then the poles are going to go back ensure that that gain is slightly greater than one and keep the oscillation from dying out. And then as the oscillation um, grows, it will migrate back to the J omega axis and that mechanism will, will sustain. So we're going, to, um, we're going to see that when we look at practical oscillators. So I gave you here a three-step uh, procedure to analyze oscillators, uh, but there is a uh, there is a simpler there is a simpler method. So let's just say simpler. And that is to assume that you got oscillations. at the frequency uh, and then analyze uh, the circuit. So we're, now you have a circuit in front of you. So assume that the oscillation is there at omega naught and uh, analyze the circuit. So you do that by dividing by the output voltage, um, which gets you um, This is the denominator, okay? The denominator of the um, the transfer function, and then equate the real part to zero. 
and also the imaginary part to zero. And what you're going to find, because now you have two equations, I remember you um, um, you need to find two unknowns for the two parts of the criterion. And what you will find is that one equation uh, yields the frequency of oscillation and then And from the other, uh, you get the condition for oscillation. Or for sustain, this is very important. An important uh, very important qualifier for sustain oscillations. Okay. So, and I said that um, we really needed to start with that condition being a slightly greater than one, uh, and we were going to do that with some nonlinear techniques in the feedback uh, loop. So let's talk about that. So remember that we need Theoretically, so uh, and again, if you make it just one, it's never going to be um, as you power up, as you get some, let's say, real noise base or temperature drift, it may fall. Uh, below one. So whatever you got going is either going to die out or not to start at all. So um, then the oscillation will die out. If, on the other hand, the other practical issue is that if Uh, if the loop the the magnitude of the loop gain uh, becomes uh, meaningfully greater than one, then you will get um, the oscillation. will um, grow to saturation. Okay? So again, uh, what we need to do is to ensure 
So we need to um, we need to ensure that we start up with uh, greater than one, with the loop gain greater than one, not by, not by much, um, just a little bit. Uh, so that means that those poles are going to be positioned with a very small real part uh, actually on the um, right hand side of the S plane. So we want to start with that condition and then um, as the oscillations uh, as the oscillation grows, then we want the uh, the poles to um, to migrate to the to the imaginary axis and then as I said we do this uh, with nonlinear ap amplitude control so that's the, the, the main practical motivation behind it. Okay. Dr. Hernandez? Yes. Uh, for this case, uh, is the one in reference to the unity of the amplitude control? No, this is uh, in reference to the amplitude or the, the magnitude, not the amplitude, but the magnitude of the transfer function or the loop gain A times beta. So those are, those are functions of, of S. Now, the, the nonlinear amplitude control is going to be part of that. It's going to be part of that, but it's going to be also a function of the output. And as the output grows, so essentially what you have is a dynamic transfer function that it changes itself. As the output grows, it becomes it becomes a linear system. But it starts up being well, it is it's always a linear system that has a characteristic at power up and that characteristic is that this expression is greater than one but as the oscillations grow because part of this at this point has this nonlinear components factored in there as the oscillations grow that expression becomes such that now this is what is met instead of this. This is no longer true, but this is true. Notice that they cannot be bo both true at the same time. And for that to happen, to make this transition, I mean, I could be more clear and just say equals one, to go from A, the magnitude of A beta greater than one to the magnitude of A beta being equal to one, something has to change. They cannot be true at the same time. And what changes is this is changing dynamically. This is a function also of the output and how that, that output changes that characteristic uh, or that loop gain such that it's different. So this is changing. A beta is changing. And as the oscillations grow, 
you go from a representation where that magnitude is greater than one to a representation where that magnitude is equal to one. Does, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And uh, just so I can clarify, uh, the loop gain, when you're talking about the poles uh, going towards the imaginary axis, that's because uh, the loop gain is defined in the transfer function uh, in the denominator. That's that's correct. So, so remember that this loop gain defines the the poles of the of the system. So the poles of the system is is given by the roots of one minus a beta. So at first when when this when this um when this is greater than zero, when the magnitude of that is greater than zero, you have a condition where those poles are, let's say, over here. So under that condition, we have here So this is uh, j omega, and let's say this is the real port. So now here you have and the circuit is such that as the output grows, as the oscillation grows, this pulse come into here. So now at that point, implying also that so something happened, something happens via this uh, nonlinear amplitude control which is a function of the output of the circuit that makes this sigma have changes value from something greater than zero to zero. And that's what we call nonlinear amplitude control. Does that help? Uh, yes, that does. Thank you. So I basically could um, write that out and say that this corresponds to a starting with a pulse uh, in the right hand uh, plane and then pulling them to the J Omega axis. So we must we must do that with nonlinear circuitry, okay? So let's look at uh, let's look at a pro pop uh, popular oscillator oscillator <clears throat> um, the is it's an op amp uh, it's an op amp based oscillator uh, using resistors and capacitors. Um, so let's take a look at that in the 
in the book. Okay. But the by the way, these are some examples of this uh, nonlinear um, amplitude control. I mean, we're not we're not really um, we're not really talking about anything super complicated. But for example, you can see here that this first um, this first circuit here. So here we have uh, just an operational amplifier. Uh, and if we have this amplifier, OK, we can actually change its gain dynamically. Because as the output voltage grows, then this diodes essentially are going to become forward biased. And they're going to bypass R2. And then what that means is that the feedback gain, which is given by R3 plus R2 divided by R1, is going to become smaller because the, the feedback resistance is going to become smaller. So this is uh, essentially the techniques that we are talking about. Uh, and, Dr. Hernandez, I actually had a question about uh, nonlinear amplitude control. Yeah. So if this starts in the right hand plane, would that make like the system unstable? Yes. You want it to be unstable to start. That's the whole okay. point. How do you then take it out of that unstable zone and make it mar marginally stable so that the oscillations continue? You don't want it to be stable because if it's stable, that means that the oscillations are going to die out. Because you're going to have, the natural response is going to have a, um, a dampening exponential. Remember that the value of sigma is essentially the exponent of uh, that exponential term. And if, if sigma is positive, that's why you are unstable, is because now the exponent has a positive, uh, is positive, and that exponential is going to make it the, make the output or the response grows. Is if you are in the, uh, on the left hand side, then the exponent is negative and is decaying, so the natural response in this case, the oscillation is going to die out. But if you are in the imaginary axis, then the exponent is zero, meaning that you have just the pure oscillation. If you remember your uh, just your second order uh, natural response uh, analysis. Does that make sense? Yeah, it actually. Thank you. Okay, so that's actually what we're talking about. We're talking about that e to the minus, you know, or e to the uh, to the sigma times cosine, you know, blah, 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 okay? That's exactly the response. We want to keep just the cosine. Dr. Hernandez? Yeah. I had a follow-up on John's. Um, so when we're talking about this circuit, um, you were talking about how the diodes were to bypass R2. So is that kind of the idea for the pullback? Right. Or Correct. So this is a this is just an amplifier. This is not an oscillator. Okay. This is just an amplifier, just to demonstrate that you can you can add nonlinear components. In this case, diodes. You can add that to actually dynamically change the nature of an amplifier. So this would be an amplifier that will have different gain for different uh, values of the input. So you can say, well, if, if my input is going to produce an output above certain level, then the gain is going to be less because I'm going to essentially bypass R2.
but this is a circuit where if your input is very is below certain level your gain is going to be higher because n the output is not going to be high enough to bypass or to forward bias the diodes and therefore now your gain is higher because it's R3 plus R2 over R1 plus 1 this is a, this is a positive gain uh, this is an, an all inverting amplifier do you see that? Yes. So basically, uh, this is a um, this is an amplifier that um, So V in and this is V out. This is an amplifier that uh, for low low values of V in up to certain point is going to have a gain greater than one. So a slope is greater than one. Okay. That's a straight line. But then after a certain value of V in, when R2 gets bypassed, the gain is going to still get greater than one, but at a smaller slope. That's what I'm trying to draw here, okay? So this here, the gain here is one plus, well, I'm not gonna write it with this uh, thing because it's very hard, but the gain here is one uh, plus R3 plus R3 divided by R1 and the gain here is 1 uh, plus R3 divided by R1. Do you see that? So the gain is lower here. Do you see that? Yeah, I do. Thank you. Alright, so this is... An, but you could have, you could have actually... So this is a way of doing I mean, you heard of automatic gain control. Analog automatic gain control uses this principle because you want to change the gain as your output uh, in, uh, increases. So you can actually have, instead of R3 and R2, you could have several of this. And then to make the levels different, you, you just stack more diodes um, in series, okay? If you can visualize that. Does that make sense? But that's just an example of an amplifier to sort of talk about the oscillator. Uh, sort of an example of a nonlinear amplifier, which the uh, automatic gain control amplifier would qualify, just to, to, to show you that in reality, we're going to, what we're saying is we're going to be using this principle, but in reality, this has nothing to do with oscillators. This is just an amplifier. Okay? So the, the actual oscillator is, is here. Um, so the actual oscillator is, um, is here. So now we are essentially taking advantage of that same principle. And you can see that there are there is no um, there is no input here. So we have now a a system that has that has reactive components in it. So we have a capacitor and we have an inductor, and we have uh, some resistors. So, as the oscillation, as the oscillation uh, grows, the nature of the transfer function. So this is um, there is going to be an A, and there is going to be a beta here, and that transfer function is going to change when the when the output of this node 
when this node uh, goes above, let's say, 0.7 volts, if we're assuming that the diode is going to become four bias at plus or minus 0.7 volts, we have two diodes in there. So uh, they have, they're connected differently. So what that means is that when this node goes above 0.7 or below 0.7, those diodes are going to become four biased. And that's going to keep that oscillation at the output between some, some range. OK? So that's applying the same principle to an oscillator. Let, let's take a look at uh, the Winbridge uh, oscillator. So this is a... Now notice that this is just the plain oscillator for the analysis and looking at the principle of oscillation, it doesn't have the the amplitude control, the non the nonlinear amplitude control uh, for a stabilization of the pulse. Okay, so we're going to take a look at this so we can we can analyze it um, as a matter of uh, example. Okay, so remember remember this uh, quantity. So we have a um, a pi. Z sub P, which we're going to, uh, so the P stands for the parallel imp uh, impedance, and a Z sub S, which is the serious impedance of the uh, capacitor and the resistor, and then we have two other, uh, two other resistors. Okay, then we have uh, a node called VA, and then we have our output uh, node. So what I want to do is is go and um, analyze this circuit. Given those, uh, given those parameters, okay. So note that the the A network is given by R one and R two, and this is in a positive or non-inverting amplifier configuration because we're getting the feedback added into the positive input of the op-amp. So the ZP and CS form your beta network. Okay? So let's look at um, how, we, how we write that up. So if we stick with the notation and um, in the figure, remember what your loop gain is. That's um, so this here is your gain, which for a um, non inverting amplifier in this specific example, and then if we look at our beta network, which is sampling the output and producing the signal that is going into the positive input of the op-amp, we see that um, it's just a voltage divider of the, where we are dividing the output voltage into that V sub A signal going into the positive uh, input of the amplifier. And we're dividing that uh, output voltage into the parallel impedance. So ZP, divided by CP and ZS, okay? So clearly, I have uh, an A, I have a beta. So I have an LS. And if I just um, manipulate that a bit, you will get
where y is just the the admittance or one over zp. Okay, just because they are in parallel, so it's going to be easy to write out the um, the expression that way. So if I go back to this expression here, and uh, for my Laplace impedances for the capacitor, I will get 1 plus R2 over R1, and I will get 3 plus S C R plus 1 over S C R and the frequency response is going to be then 1 over R2 R1 like so okay so again we remember that we have to check uh, what is the, the condition um, of oscillation and then also find what would be the frequency of oscillation for this circuit okay and um, I can remind you that the loop gain will be real because that's what having a phase of, of one, I mean a phase of zero is. So that is that the phase uh, of L of J <clears throat> omega is zero at if you solve for that so you would take that expression on j omega and find the real part find the imaginary part so the phase is going to be essentially the imaginary part divided by the real part and you solve for uh, for j uh, or you just solve for that expression and you will find that at omega naught, um, which means that the oscillation frequency is given by 1 over RC. So this is a very elegant, very neat uh, result because if you have that circuit um, and the resistance is the same as the capacitance in the series part uh, of the beta network as, is, as it is in the parallel part. So these two components will give you the oscillation. If you have a frequency of oscillation, uh, then you pick one, one of R or C and then calculate the other one. Uh, and you know that omega naught is essentially, I mean, it is two pi, the frequency that you want. Okay, so that gives us the the frequency of oscillation. So then, the other part is when uh, oscillations will start. So for this circuit, so you normally will find out that the the frequency has to do with the reactive components. They are in the um, in the beta network, then the condition for oscillation is going to do with the gain part they are in the A network. So oscillation will start at that frequency given by those components in the beta network. Uh, if the loop gain And we can achieve that 
Um, If you solve um, the expression if R2 is twice as much as um, R1. Okay? So that, that basically, this basically become your design equations for the circuit. Now you have a topology. You had the system level, you know, this is always the, the mantra. You have the system level equations that came from looking at the feedback perspective analysis of the circuit and coming up with the criteria. Then you have a topology, you analyze it, you, you find your, your A and beta, you apply the, the criteria. And now from that, you get design equations. So you have two designs equation here. This is one and the other one is Okay, those are your two design equations that govern this oscillator to find, you know, if you're given, uh, and, and an oscillator only has one spec, oscillate at this frequency. So you're given that from the spec, and now you have to meet this condition, and you have to satisfy this equation. All right, so uh, with this in mind, I just want to just um, show you examples of oscillators. Uh, but again, in general, this is the this is the, the theory behind it. Uh, satisfy the criteria. Uh, analyze the uh, the topology, fit that to the criteria, and come up with the design equation. And you have uh, already heard about this methodology in filters. We talked about this, but this applies to not only uh, not only filters, applies to oscillators as well. So I'm going to switch back um, to the figures and just show some some examples. All right. So this would be that. We're in bridge oscillator with the now with the nonlinear amplitude control. Okay? And I guess this example is throws in, you know, oscillators are finicky. They need to be tuned. So one way to tune it so it actually does start is to have a variable control uh, resistor just so you can, you know, again, that's that's a practical matter. But if you made that uh, that resistance fixed, ideally uh, it would it would um, start, and then as the oscillation grows, this 10k essentially um, gets out of the the picture. If the oscillation starts dying out, the diodes become become uh, reverse bias. The 10k comes back in the picture. Now the uh, the poles are on the right hand side, and oscillations are picking up again, and you get this uh, this mechanism. And here you have the beta network. Um, so this is a practical Wimbridge oscillator, in that you have the nonlinear amplitude control, and further you have a variable resistor to make sure that the condition is met on this side, in the, in the part of this resistor, uh, just to account for any variability of components and tolerances and things like that. So very practical circuit. Uh, this will actually work and, and oscillate. Another type of, um, another type of oscillator is a phase shift oscillator. 
So that is a um, oscillator where you have a RC ladder that ensures your phase shift and some amplification element. But still, this this um, the same principles applies anyway. This is a different topology that you could implement that you could implement like so practically. So here you have the amplification um, here you have the amplification element with uh, the amplitude control here okay so the gain is going to change as d2 and d1 become forward biased uh, as a function of the amplitude of the output you have another resistor here uh, to tune in make sure that that happens the f that those two would be the uh, the feedback resistor and then you have the beta network as a phase shift uh, network uh, composed of um, an RC ladder and this essentially here becomes a summing uh, junction where you are putting your feedback after your beta here so this is the the beta here and this is your a here okay so that's a practical implementation of a phase shift oscillator that will work has your all the elements you can you can tune it with uh, and dial it in make sure that it starts with the digital I mean not a digital but a um, variable resistor and also has the nonlinear amplitude control. Other, um, let's see. Let's look at another, another example. Uh, so this is um, a quadrature oscillator. Um, So essentially, here you have um, here you have your beta, making sure that that is um, that is. Your, your phase shift essentially here you have your A with amplitude uh, control and you also have some uh, variable resistance to ensure that the conditions are met so you start seeing the um, the mantra here um, Let's look at another example, another couple of examples. Actually, in, in this one, you have some gain. You have some gain and some um, phase shift in each part, because here you have this capacitor here. Okay. Overall, still, you have the, um, the conditions met. And all the elements, uh, all the practical elements of nonlinear amplitude control here, and uh, just some variable resistor for fine tuning here. Notice that this variable resistors they have a nominal value, so it's just that if you put just a value there, it has to be two R. And if you put a value there, it may not be quite 2R, or it could be just a little above. So how can you ensure that? Because that's part of the condition to start the oscillation is to put a, a variable resistor that you can actually um, manually 
uh, set. So again, that's a practical, a practical matter. Uh, this is a, another type of uh, oscillator using an active filter in the um, in the feedback path and um, so just just a, a different topology and uh, you can see uh, diodes uh, that form the um, that they take care of the nonlinear amplitude control so all these circuits could be analyze you know the same way that we did the Rimbridge um, oscillator okay so here you have from a system perspective you have the frequency selective part and you have here the amplification part Uh, two more, two more popular examples. Um, now, notice that all these uh, oscillators uh, have not used um, inductors. So remember what I told you that sort of the let's just call it the audio, you know, range and uh, just call it the 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 kilo the kilohertz or low megahertz type range you really don't want to use uh, inductors you can you know get away with uh, using using capacitors uh, and resistors uh, as, as the frequency go goes up then uh, inductors become attractive uh, they can have high Q high selectivity so two popular uh, oscillators that are used in the in the RF uh, range are the culpits and the Hartley uh, oscillator okay so and um, so name after the inventors so this is essentially a um, notice that we're not using op amps uh, we're using just a, a transistor and so this is very attractive for RF type of um, oscillators are based on a on a tank circuit, which is basically an inductor in uh, in parallel with some capacitance. So this is the uh, the culprit's um, the culprit's uh, topology. And then this is the Hartley uh, topology. Just basically changing the, the inductance with the resistance. Just two, two different uh, topologies. The same uh, analysis uh, applies. You have your uh, beta network in each one of them. And of course the transistor which is operating in common source configuration will give you your amplification from gate gate to source okay um let's see another Another, um, let's look for another. So this is another um, this is another inductor. Uh, or tank-based um, 
oscillator based on a cross-coupled um, pair of transistor. So you can see here your your tank circuits in the um, in the top and the cross couple transistors and an actual implementation. Um, you just have to bias the transistor with the current source. But if you were going to analyze this, okay, uh, and look at the AC, at the AC analysis, essentially you can clearly uh, visualize that oscillator as the um, as two two amplifiers. So this looks a lot like the like the quadrature type of um, oscillator that was up and base that we saw previously. So essentially, you have uh, amplification, you have beta, another amplification, you have beta, and as long as all this together meets the criterion, you will get uh, oscillations. And again, you can you can analyze it just just the way that uh, we did for the uh, Winbridge oscillator but you just have to use the transistor gain equations of what the um, the output uh, current which is going to develop a voltage across this loading resistor that's what is these resistors are there to load the amp uh, the transistor amplifier and develop an output voltage uh, as a function of the gate voltage so you use those uh, transistor equations to come up with your a uh, come up with your beta follow the uh, the criteria find your uh, frequency of oscillation and the condition for oscillation and those two will give you design equations to calculate uh, rp l and c or at least choose some of them and calculate the rest because um, you only have two, two equations from the conditions. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop here and we should be able to finish the chapter um, on Tuesday. So these chapters are going to go quickly. This one and the next, they're short. So, um, and then we can have our midterm.